So as we've seen, gel electrophoresis can separate fragments of DNA based solely on their size, right, without knowing anything about the actual sequence of those fragments. A southern blot needs a little bit of additional sequence knowledge, right, so that we can synthesize a probe, but what we get in return is the ability to find a fragment in a complex mixture of other fragments. If we have a little bit more sequence information, in particular if we know the sequence on the ends of a fragment that we're interested in, we can not only find it in a mixture, but we can make a lot more of it for additional analysis. And the process by which we do so is called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. So PCR is basically DNA replication in a test tube. And so remember that if I have a single strand of DNA, a, an enzyme called a DNA polymerase can synthesize the other strand using the base pairing rules. So where it sees an A, it adds a T, and vice versa, and where it sees a G, it adds a C, and vice versa. And so, if we put this strand of DNA and the individual nucleotides that, are, that need to be polymerized and the enzyme to do this in a test tube, does it just replicate? Not quite, because there's one further constraint, because a DNA polymerase, this enzyme, can't just create a new DNA strand. Instead, it can only extend a pre-existing DNA strand. So, if I start with this strand TA, and this is just the three prime end of this strand, the DNA polymerase can come in and add the next base, and then it can add the next base, et cetera, et cetera, but it can't start this process. And this is why we need to know a little bit about the sequence of the ends of the fragment we want to copy, because if I start with a single strand of DNA, let's say this is the five prime end and the three prime end, then I chemically synthesize a small DNA molecule that is complementary to this end of the molecule. We'll call this a primer. Now I can add a DNA polymerase and a bunch of nucleotides to this, and the polymerase will come in and synthesize the rest of it for me. And if I have two primers, then if I started with a double-stranded piece of DNA and I melt it apart, the three prime end and the five prime end, now I can put a primer right here and I can put a primer right there and now I can make two new molecules out of a single individual strand, right? If we, using these two primers, I can make both strands at once. The final insight here is if I use a particular kind of polymerase and change the temperature, I can make this process happen over and over and over. So, for example, let's say that I start with a double-stranded piece of DNA, and we'll call this double-stranded piece of DNA the template. And now, I heat it up to almost boiling, right? And these strands separate. Go ahead and put some arrows on there so we can track them. So the top strand we'll put over here, and the bottom strand we'll set over here. Now, I cool it down a little bit, and my primers attach themselves. And then I wait. And I wait, and I wait. And what happens is that the DNA polymerase that I've got in here comes in, and it synthesizes, 
the remainder of those two strands. I started with one molecule, now I have two. But now I can repeat the process, right? And so I melt, I anneal, I extend. I melt, I anneal, I extend. I melt, I anneal, I extend. And each time this process happens, assuming it happens perfectly, it never really does, but it's pretty close. One molecule becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, etc. And after 30 or 40 cycles, I've gone from a very small amount of DNA to a very large amount, right? That's why this is called a chain reaction. It's an exponential growth in the amount of DNA that I'm copying, basically until I run out of materials to copy it with, until I run out of uh, primers or nucleotides. So PCR super useful for taking a small amount of DNA and turning it into a large amount of DNA. However, it's also really useful for selecting DNA out of a mixture. Let me show you what I mean. So if I start with a long double-stranded piece of DNA and I design primers that land here, and here, right? I do my melt step, and then my, I allow my primers to anneal, and so now, um, and then extend, and so against this one, the first extension happens here and probably continues on past that first primer. The second time, the extension probably continues on past this primer. However, the next time that I melt, anneal, and extend, not only am I going to get copies of this one, I'm also going to get copies of these. And so now let's imagine that I start with this one, which has gone on and on and on, and now this primer binds, and it, and it extends, but it stops. Right? And for this one, it's quite long, but now my second primer binds and it extends and it stops. And so hopefully you can see how repeating this process over and over, eventually the vast majority of the molecules of DNA are just going to be from this primer to this primer. I'm just amplifying the region of my template that falls between my two PCR primers. And now, if I want to analyze this DNA further, for example, I want to know its size, I can run it on a gel. I also have enough DNA now to actually determine its entire nucleotide sequence, right? I can send it off to a contract research lab and ask them to sequence it for me. So all of these methods are all well and good, right? Restriction enzymes and gel electrophoresis and southern blotting and PCR. How do we use them to find genetic variations? That's our next topic.